Welcome to Chapter 4, Part 1 in Anatomy Physiology 1. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about DNA, how it divides, how it replicates, how it, you can make messenger RNA using it, and then we'll get into genetics. If you took an average person's DNA out of their cells and laid it end to end, you could go all the way to Jupiter and back 10 times. So you are neither small nor insignificant. You're just very well folded. By the end of this talk, hopefully you will understand why this is incredibly amazing. But if two identical twins married identical twins, and had babies, the babies would all be brothers and sisters, not cousins. We're going to learn about DNA and how different segments of DNA make up genes, and these genes determine our hereditary traits. What do you look like? Are you short? Are you tall? Do you have red hair? Can you curl your tongue? Things like that. Are you likely to have type 1 diabetes? Does cystic fibrosis run in your family? Did you get color blindness or hemophilia from your mother? Another thing I hope that I can convince you of is that we are all one race. We fill out questionnaires and ask, you know, are you Caucasian? Are you Hispanic? We're all one race. The color of your skin comes from your latitude and your climate. So people who are closer to Norway are going to be lighter skinned, and people who are closer to the equator are going to be darker skinned. And this is a consequence of ultraviolet light, not of some racial thing. In the last chapter, we talked about chemistry and how hydrogen and oxygen bond together. They don't bond together differently for different races. We all do the same chemical reactions with the same elements. The study of nucleic acids and genes is relatively new. A Swiss biochemist was looking at white blood cells in pus that he got out of bandages and he was the one who gave us the name nucleon which we now call deoxyribonucleic acid so we kept this part of his word but we added the deoxyribo because there's two kinds of nucleic acid there's ribonucleic acid which would be RNA and then there's deoxy ribonucleic acid, which is DNA. And DNA is where our genes are. By, the ninth, by 1900, we knew that there was a sugar, phosphate, and a nitrogen-containing base. So it's only been about 120 years since we actually learned this. And it was, was not until 1953 that we learn the structure of DNA and that it's a double helix. So this is a kind of a new, within my lifetime, uh, thing that we've discovered. Humans have 46 DNA molecules, which we call chromosomes, in almost all of our cells. The red blood cells don't have a nucleus, and the uh, sperm and the egg have half this number, 23, so when the sperm plus the egg gets together, 23 plus 23 equal 46, and you have the makings of a, of a baby. The average human DNA molecule is about 2 inches long, but you can't see it under a light microscope. It's that tiny. You have to have a special electron microscope to actually be able to see it, even though it's 2 inches long. DNA has four bases, adenine, 
thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And the uh, uracil that you see here is not in DNA. So that's a, a very misleading slide here where it says DNA structure and function, and then they put uracil on here. Uracil is only found in RNA. So make note of that. This is a poorly constructed slide. And here's why molecular biologists don't write children's songs. So you can try singing this to the tune of O MacDonald. It just doesn't quite have the zing of the original song. A, G, T, C are the four bases which make amino acids. Here is a drawing showing you the adenine part of a nucleotide and then the deoxyribose, the sugar part, and the phosphate, which is phosphorus with four oxygens around it. So when we talk about ATP, we talk about adenosine triphosphate. So it's going to have three of these. It'll have this phosphate and another phosphate and another and you can pull the phosphates off and get a pop of energy. There are four nitrogen containing bases in DNA and four in RNA. The difference between DNA and RNA is DNA has thymine but no uracil and RNA has uracil and no thymine. So both DNA and RNA have cytosine, guanine, and adenine. This is a space-filling model of the double helix of DNA. And then this is a cartoon version showing what's holding this together in these grooves. So A's like to hydrogen bond with T's. And G's like to hydrogen bond with C's. And of course, T, A. So you got A to T, T to A, G to C, C to G. Hydrogen bonding. Not really a bond, it's more of a, an electrostatic force. But it holds it together fairly well. If you heat it up, then these will drift apart. Or if you get an enzyme in there, you can push them apart. So we're going to learn how we can take these two strands apart and do things with them. I have read this, and it's one of the things that I teach because it's in the textbook, but nobody's convinced me of it yet. It says we only have about 20,000 genes. So of all the DNA that we have in our nucleus, only about 2% makes up the genes, and 98% is doing something else. So they say this, but they haven't convinced me because we have such random genes. For example, we have, some of us have a gene where if we eat asparagus and then we urinate, you can smell the asparagus in your urine. And it has an unbelievably strong offensive odor. So you sit down and you pee and you're like, oh my gosh. What is it? And you think, oh, I ate asparagus. But other people don't. Why, of the 20,000 genes that we could possibly have, would we have one for that? And if you look at someone's forehead, some people have their hair straight across, and some people have it coming down in a widow's peak. Why would we have a gene just to put hair down the middle of our forehead? Why would we waste one of the 20,000 genes? So I'm telling you this, but they're going to have to convince me of it. Because, again, remember this is a baby science. We're learning as we go along. And so every time you look at a textbook, you're going to find that they've changed some things in there. This is the first textbook that I've read where the author has the same misgivings that I have about... James Watson and Francis Crick getting the Nobel Prize for determining the structure of DNA. They, they did not. A woman named Rosalind Franklin did the 
crystallization of DNA, and then she took uh, an x-ray picture of the DNA crystal and realized that it was a double helix, and she showed it to Watson and Crick, who had done no work at all, and they went off and published a paper saying that they had discovered that the shape of the DNA was a double helix. And for that, they got the Nobel Prize. Rosalind died of cancer when she was only 37, so she didn't get any credit at all. And the uh, laboratory where she was working belonged to Maurice Wilkins, and so he got the Nobel Prize also. So I have mixed emotions about that. As I mentioned, you can't see DNA with a light microscope, but this is what it looks like if you're looking at it under an um, electron microscope. So it, it almost looks like a string of beads. And what this is is a, a wad of proteins that they've wrapped some of the DNA around. This is a transmission electron micrograph picture where they've taken a cell and sliced it open. So this is the nucleus. There's the nuclear envelope. And if you look, the DNA tends to be out at the edge, not scattered so much throughout. And then this is the nucleolus. Remember, this is RNA that's making ribosomes. If you look, this stuff, is the endoplasmic reticulum. In most of the cartoon pictures they have, they don't show how incredibly extensive the endoplasmic reticulum network actually is. Here's the slide that says in words what I just showed you in a picture. You have 46 chromosomes. There are about six feet of the DNA. So it two inches for each chromosome, and you've got 46 chromosomes. Not all chromosomes are the same length. You've got some that are shorter and some that are longer. So you've got roughly six feet. And it does look granular in the electron microscope because it's wrapped around some proteins, complexed with proteins called histones. So when DNA is a double helix, we call it the DNA double helix, and then you start wrapping it around the histones to make those little uh, bead-looking things. And at some point, once you've gotten it looped around and then looping around like this, we start calling it chromatin. Chromatin. And then, only if the cell's going to divide, do we then start looping these loops more and more tightly and more and more tightly until you can actually see them under a light microscope. And when they're like that, we call them chromosomes. So it's called chromatin, unless the cell is dividing, and then we call the DNA a chromosome. And when we talk about mitosis, just to make it a little bit more confusing, chromosomes, when they're held together as a double, and we'll talk about why they're held together as a double, they're called chromatids, T-I-D, chromatids. So a chromosome, before it divides and goes into two different cells, is called chromatids. But if the cell is not dividing at all, then it is known as chromatin. There are two major times where we want to pull the A's and T's and C's and G's apart. And those times would be if I want to make a, a copy of each of these. So I'm going to double my DNA, which is what I'd have to do if I'm going to divide my cell. Because if I don't double my DNA before I split my cell in half, then eventually I'll run out of chromosomes. So you have 46 chromosomes. You double them so that you have 92. And then you split them in half, and then you have two cells who have 46 each. So you're going to use an enzyme helicase to unwind and 
the other time you're going to do it, this if you want to double your DNA, you're going to unwind the entire uh, chromosome from one end to the other. But if I just want to read a gene, I may just open up a small segment, just this segment right here, and just read uh, maybe a thousand to ten thousand bases for a gene. And then I'm going to close it back up again. If you were going to major in biochemistry, you'd need to know all of these things about how many DNA turns there are and how many histones there are per cluster. But all I want you to know is you've got strings of DNA, and to condense them, you wrap them around a bundle of histone proteins to shorten them. So according to this slide, it's a thousand times shorter than the original molecule. I thought this was a funny visual to help you remember the name of the enzyme that pulls the double helix apart, the helicase. So here's a guy pretending to be helicase, and here is a wooden block. He's pretending to pull apart, and that's supposed to be the double DNA. The reason that we have our DNA in the form of chromatin when the cell is not dividing is so that we can go and use the different segments of uh, DNA that make the genes. We are constantly turning genes on and turning genes off. And recently, we have a whole new exciting field called epigenetics that we'll talk about um, uh, pretty soon. When a cell divides, it can either do mitosis or meiosis. Mitosis or meiosis. Some people call it meiosis. And if you go through mitosis, you end up with two identical cells. If you do meiosis, you either end up with a sperm or an egg, depending on whether you're male or female. So here's a cartoon, and here is the chromosome in the form of two uh, sets of chromatids and he's talking to the chromatin saying dude my toast starts in five minutes and I can't believe you're not condensed yet so I need you to know the difference between chromatin chromatid and chromosome and when you have a chromosome that is getting ready to divide, you need to know that you have a centromere. So this is this area where the two things are being held together and a kinetochore, a kinetochore. The kinetochore is going to be important because you're going to have uh, microtubules attaching to help pull these apart. I hope you're watching this on a TV set instead of on your cell phone. It's fine to do that. Some people say they listen to me talking while they're out driving in traffic, and then they watch it later again on TV, and that's fine too, whatever uh, gets it into your mind. But from time to time, I'll recommend something that I, I think that you should go off and watch. So if you want to pause this video and go look in YouTube for Your Body's Molecular Machine by Veritasium. They, anything by Veritasium I have found to be extremely good. So this is a six-minute episode, and it shows the animations of DNA replication as well as mitosis and cell division. So if you've never had that, you should have had that in an introductory biology course before you started anatomy physiology. If for some uh, reason you missed it, uh, go watch this. In six minutes, it'll kind of put it in your head for you. I do want to show you this video. This is what your chromosomes look like when they start coiling up. So you can start to see individual chromosomes here. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's actually two of them. Now, this is a light microscope. This is not an electron microscope. So you could actually see this in the laboratory with the microscopes that we have. So you can see here's a one chromatid, and here's another chromatid, and they're attached to each other in the centromere. 
with and they have two kinetic cores on either side so here's this is actually a video that somebody took through their um, light microscope So here you see the chromosomes wiggling around, wiggling around, and they line up in the middle. You see all the mitochondria that are helping? Once they've lined up in the middle, half of the chromosomes are pulled one way and half of them are pulled the other way. And they're not called chromatids anymore. They're now actual chromosomes. Here's the cell pinching. And that's cytokinesis. And you end up with two cells. We'll come back and talk about mitosis, the little video that we just saw where the DNA condenses into chromosomes and divides by going to the middle and then splitting in half. We'll talk about that again uh, in the second part of this chapter. But right now I want to show you the difference between deoxyribose sugar and ribose sugar. So if you look, all of this is all the same, except for this one has just a hydrogen on this carbon. And this one has hydrogen and an oxygen on its carbon. So because this one is missing an oxygen, we call it deoxy, deoxyribose. And this is ribose. So when we're putting the uh, adenosine and we're putting the phosphate on a ribose, it will go into... RNA. And if you're putting the adenosine and the phosphate on a deoxyribose, then you're going to be putting it into DNA. So the difference between DNA and RNA, one oxygen on the sugar. Interesting. As I mentioned before, RNA has ribose but it also does not have thymine. It has uracil instead. RNA is almost always a single chain. It's not a double helix. So when we were talking about the um, organelles and the cell structure in chapter 3, one of the things I talked about was the nuclear pore the holes that are in the nucleus. So they will allow RNA in and out, but they won't allow the DNA in and out because it's a double helix. Most of the activity of RNA is out in the cytoplasm. So we remember we have the nucleolus inside the nucleus that is ribosomal RNA. It's making up the RNA that's going to go outside in the cytoplasm and make little protein factories. Three RNAs that you have to know are messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. This textbook assumes that you already know the basics of genetics. So it just kind of lightly brushes over and summarizes the things that are important. But if you've never had genetics, in introductory bio biology, you didn't have it in high school for whatever reason, then uh, see me, talk to me, and I'll hook you up with some uh, information so that you can catch up. But you're, you're already expected to, uh, if this next section doesn't make any sense to you, definitely get in touch with me because you, you need to know it. This is one of the things that always frustrated me when I was a student, so I'm assuming that you get frustrated too. And sometimes you have a teacher that makes you memorize the definition exactly as it is in the book, and if you get one word off, then you don't get credit for the definition. 
So here is the definition of a gene, an information-containing segment of DNA that codes for the production of a molecule of RNA that plays a role in synthesizing one or more proteins. Okay, that is correct, but what a what a bunch of words so in that big old long strand of dna there's a little segment of it that has the information that knows how to make a protein or maybe it knows has the information uh, to make a certain kind of rna that your body needs so be that as it may so that would be the information containing segment of dna and the molecule of RNA that it's going to make is called messenger RNA. And we're going to look at the process by which the messenger RNA is formed. And then you end up with uh, a strand of messenger RNA that slides out of the cell, goes out, finds a ribosome, and the ribosome will take transfer RNA and turn it into a protein. So there is the production of a molecule of messenger RNA and that messenger RNA with the help of a ribosome will make a protein. Now one of the things that they point out in this slide that I think is important if you believe that we only have 20,000 genes but we have millions of proteins so once you've read the gene and you have the gene product you can uh, rearrange the amino acids, you can cut off pieces, you can add pieces, you can put phosphates on it. So you can alter the proteins that are made by the genes. Ultimately, what the DNA does is it tells your body, it tells the ribosome, what order to put the 20 amino acids. Basically, that's the long and short of it. Now, keep in mind that you have 46 chromosomes. Uh, one of the questions that students always ask me is, can we have uh, uh, babies by a monkey? Well, monkeys have different numbers of chromosomes, like 48 chromosomes. We have 46. So the sperm and the egg wouldn't go together. You'd have the wrong information. So as far as I know, in no laboratory have they put monkey DNA and human DNA together to make a monkey-human hybrid. But in humans, you're going to take your 46 chromosomes. Half of those chromosomes came from your mom in the egg, and half came from your dad in the sperm. And when it comes time for you to make your eggs in your sperm, you're going to randomly go through, and we number the chromosomes 1 through 23. So you may put chromosome number 1 from dad, and chromosome number 2 would be the one you got from your mom. Chromosome number three might be the one you got from your mom, and four might be from your dad. So this is why we are so genetically uh, variable, depending on who we marry, because you independently assort each chromosome and decide which one's going to go in your egg and which one's going to go in your sperm. There are 3.1 billion A's, and C's, and T's, and G's in the human genome. And one of the most astounding things that we did was we just decided that we were going to find out every single A, and C, and T, and G in a human cell. And many countries came together, and they were working, they were sequencing, you know, which came first, an A, or a C, or a T, or a G, and then they were sharing the information. It was, a, it was a glorious time of people working together and sharing information. And as people were working along, some people made discoveries and said, hey, if you do it this way, you can read it faster. 
And so what we thought was going to take so many years to do, uh, we shortened it and we finished doing the Human Genome Project well before we thought we ever would. So we know where all the genes are on the different chromosomes. Here's a picture of chromosome number one, and you can't really read it, but going along here, it shows here is the gene for cataracts, here is a gene for glaucoma, here's a gene for colon cancer, well that's one of you to hope you don't get. Here's a gene for breast cancer in your ducts. So inside of your breast, you have the fatty tissue, and you have the ducts that the milk comes out through the nipple. So if you happen to have this gene, then you're going to uh, have a higher chance of getting ductal breast cancer. It's fascinating that you can go out on the Internet and do a search and find out each of the chromosomes and they'll have a map like that showing you all the genes and on which chromosome and in which order they appear. So on one slide it says we have about 20,000 genes and on this slide it says that we have less than a hundred thousand genes. So again it depends on who you talk to, which book you're reading, and which studies you're looking at as to how many genes we actually have. We are 99.99% .99 genetically identical. So you look at the person next to you and you go, huh? I'm that much the same as that other person? Because looking around the classroom, you're going to see all kinds of people, short people, tall people, fat people, people with freckles, people with frizzy hair, people with straight hair, all kinds of things. And you're like, how can we be 99.99% .99 genetically identical? Well, when you consider how much DNA you actually have, you can still have 3 million bases, the A's and C's and T's and G's that are different. When you're making copies of your cells so that your cells can divide, you go in, you take the DNA, you make an extra strand of DNA, and you end up with, you start with two, and you end up with four strands. So you have one double helix, and then you end up with two double helices. And one will go one way, and one will go the other. So this cartoon is showing that periodically, the A's and C's and T's and G's have an error and one of the bases disappears. So here's two bases talking to each other, waiting to double the DNA. And he says, you know, what do you want to do? You want to play cards? And then he goes, Glenn, Glenn, where are you? And he goes, oh, I guess I have to play solitaire. So what can cause you to lose an A or a C or a T or a G? What can cause your DNA to mutate? Smoking cigarettes, getting too much sun, tanning beds, uh, radiation coming in from outer space. Some people have jobs that are hazardous. Getting overheated in certain areas because you're too close to, say, a blast furnace. So knowing this, you need to protect yourself. When you have um, an x-ray of your teeth, or they think you broke a bone and they do an x-ray, you're going to be messing up some of your DNA. So luckily, we have repair enzymes, and hopefully they'll realize that one of the bases is missing, and they'll put it back. So we're constantly having to repair our DNA because it's constantly mutating. Uh, there's some stuff on this slide that's a little bit misleading. 
you do have there are, there are people who have a higher chance of having cancer because they're genetically predisposed to it they actually have a gene for it and if the gene gets turned on then they're going to get that kind of cancer uh, there's one gene that i'm thinking of that it runs in a family so whenever you go to the doctor they make you fill out that whole big thing of, what does your mother have? What does your dad have? What do your brothers and sisters have? What do your aunts and uncles and your grandparents have? And they look to see if you have people in your family who die of breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer because there's a gene for that. So if it runs in your family, your chances of getting one of those three is much higher than the, you know, the rest of the people out in the population. So we do know about genes that can cause you to have cancer, and we'll talk a little bit about oncogenes in a little bit. There are, there are um, genetic problems that cause Alzheimer's. For example, um, the children who are Down syndrome generally develop Alzheimer's before the age of 40. So m most people, when you think of Alzheimer's, you think of old people. In fact, a lot of people call it the old people's disease. But uh, if uh, you can be genetically programmed to have it earlier, uh, one of my uh, most favorite principals, he was fabulous. He was such an excellent principal. And um, he developed early onset Alzheimer's because he was genetically predisposed to it and he passed away. And it was... It was amazing to watch such a vibrant and amazing man uh, just um, die as his brain was filled up with a protein called amyloid, which stopped him being able to think. They're looking to see if there is a genetic uh, link to schizophrenia, obesity. Some people have... Um, immune diseases that are not triggered by the AIDS virus. Uh, if you want to watch The Boy in the Bubble starring John Travolta, you can see someone who was born without an immune system. So they couldn't fight off disease. And this is very misleading because tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria. However, because we have abused antibiotics, there are now some strains of tuberculosis that we don't have an antibiotic for. Uh, same thing with gonorrhea. They just used to give you the medicine assuming you were going to go out and get gonorrhea. And so they ended up with strains of gonorrhea that we don't have an antibiotic for. So, But that would be the genes of the bacteria, not our genes. So that's a little confusing. And as we are in the middle of this COVID epidemic and we're talking about um, the variants of the different kinds, so we started out with one kind and then we had the Delta variant and now we're looking at the Mu variant. So what happens is the RNA, so this is an RNA virus, the RNA mutates and it can make it into a weaker strain, or it can make it into a stronger, more virulent, more deadly, more easily spread. So that's why we keep watching to see about the mutations of the various uh, flu that's out there, um, pneumonia, and then we try to make vaccines against the mutations also. So it says, it's the time of the publication of this book. There were over 1,400 disease-producing mutations that we had discovered. So we know, and we can go looking for them. Now, if you know that something runs in your family, for example, people who are Jewish tend to want to marry other people who are Jewish. And because of this, a gene was uh, became more prevalent in the Jewish population. It's called Tay-Sachs. And if you have two people who have that gene and they pass it on to their baby, then the baby's brain will fill up basically with fat and it will die within, it, it won't even make it a year or two. So it is, it is a fatal disease where the brain is literally destroyed. 
Um, so this is one of the reasons why it's better to marry someone who is not closely related to you because the more closely related somebody is to you, the more likelihood that you will have one of the disease genes and you get two copies. And so then you end up passing it on to your children. If you know there's a possibility that you're going to have a genetic defect, we can test you. And if you think that you may have passed it on to your child, you can test the baby before it's born so that you can decide, unfortunately, whether or not you want a, an abortion or go ahead and have the baby and deal with the, with the disease or the syndrome that the baby will be born with. This last sentence sounds like such a uh, matter-of-fact thing. Oh, it will expand the potential for gene substitution therapy. A lot of people feel that this is playing God because if God gave you a gene for whatever this problem is, then he wants you to have it. And so if you do genetic therapy and put in a good gene to substitute for the bad gene, then you are playing God. And a lot of people are very much against it. So when scientists were looking at the A's and C's and T's and G's, they realized that the body was only coding for 20 amino acids. So they did the math and they said, oh, then you must have triplets. So you must have like AAT or ACG or TTA, something like that. You have to have three of those nucleotides to code for one amino acid. And so now we have a little table and you can actually look it up depending on which A and T or A and C or G that you have, you know which amino acid that that gene is actually coding for. Here's one that is kind of pretty, but it kind of makes my head explode a little bit. But if you start with a G, and then you have a G, and then you have another G, three Gs, you're going to end up with glycine. Or if you have a G, a G, and an A, you'll still end up with glycine. Or a G, a G, and a C, you'll still end up with glycine. If you go over here uh, to, let's see what it would be a fun one that you have heard of before. Well, here's one. C, G, C will give you arginine. C, U, U will give you leucine. So here are your 20 amino acids. And here are the codes that code for each of those. So you have duplicates. So sometimes if you mutate and you have say a G, excuse me, a G, G, and an A, and you mutate to G, G, and C, it's okay. You're still going to get glycine. So that would be a silent mutation, and you would never see any effect in the organism or the protein that's being made. Some of these are stops. So if you do those sequences, then you're going to stop your protein because otherwise you could just keep going on and on and on and on and on and making this huge, huge, huge protein. So you need some point to say, okay, we're done. We're done. And then methionine is the one that's going to start your, um, your gene. That's, that's going to be your first amino acid. This is the way you almost always see it put in a textbook in a table form instead of that uh, circular form. So you start with a U, and your second one is a U, and then your third one is a U, uh, it's cysteine, and so on. So you can read first base, second base, and then go over and pick the third base, and it'll tell you which of the um, amino acids it's going to code for. So that set of three bases in the messenger RNA is known as a codon. And on the transfer RNA is an anticodon. So we'll see that in just a minute. 
So there are 46, or excuse me, 64 possible codons to represent 20 amino acids. So again, there's some uh, duplicates, and there are three stop codons. The, the start codon is AUG. That's going to start you off. And UAG or UGA or UAA, any one of those three, will stop the protein and say, okay, that's it, we're done. So I found this cartoon I thought it was funny. Don't stop believing. So if you're too young to know that song, you need to go look it up. Don't stop believing. And here are some double helices, some strands of DNA, and they're sharing mutation stories around the campfire. And when he looked at his strand the next morning, one of the bases was gone. Now here's an interesting thing you kind of have to get your head around. So we talked about the cell divides, and each one's going to have 46 chromosomes, unless it's a sex cell or it's a red blood cell. So, But you don't turn on all the genes and all the cells. So if you happen to be a cell, a muscle cell, you're not going to turn on the genes that have anything to do with being a bone or with being uh, something in the eye or um, a fat cell. So you're, each cell will only turn on the genes it needs in order to do what it does as its cell type. Skin cells are not like nerve cells, and they turn on different genes because they have different functions. When we do the unit on histology and talk about the different cell types, you'll see that they have completely different functions. You have endocrine cells that are busy making hormones. One way you can turn a gene off is to put a methyl group on it. So here's a little cartoon that um, this lady made. So it says, hey, how have you been, methyl? I have this great idea for a protein I want to make. It's going to be so cool. Just you wait and see. It'll have all these amino acids and a highly complex structure that will make it. And there's methyl. And it bonds to the DNA and shuts it off. So now you're not going to read that gene. So that's how your different cells learn not to be the wrong cell type. Because you're going to have to turn off all the genes that don't have anything to do with that particular cell type. So anyway, this is, I thought this was a cute way of showing methyl turning the gene off, silencing it. Here are two words that students struggle with. So I'm hoping you'll take a little time, maybe pause the video here, and think about how can I put this in my mind so I won't get these two words confused. The word transcription is where you're going to open up the DNA, and you're going to make a strand of messenger RNA using the gene, using the DNA, to make the messenger RNA. This happens inside the nucleus, and then the messenger RNA, the mRNA, leaves through the nuclear pore and goes out into the cytoplasm, finds a ribosome, and the ribosome translates the messenger RNA into protein by putting one amino acid attaching it to the next amino acid, attaching it to the next amino acid. So transcription is the formation of the messenger RNA using the gene, the DNA gene. Translation is when the messenger RNA goes out in the cytoplasm, finds a ribosome, and then it is translated from messenger RNA into amino acids, which make up a protein. Transcription, translation. They both start with trans, and students just get the two mixed up.
So don't you be that student. So we talked about helicase and how you can pull the DNA open so that you can replicate the DNA and make an extra copy. But in the case of reading a gene, we're going to pull the DNA open, but we're going to do it with uh, RNA polymerase. So it's going to bind to the DNA. It's going to open up the helix, not all the way from the end. It'll just make a bubble. So here's a cartoon I found. Here's your DNA double helix right here, DNA double helix. And there'll be a promoter area that says, okay, start here. We need to turn it on right here. And you're going to pull just that part of the DNA open that you need to read for the gene. Not the whole thing, just this little bubble here. And you're going to make the messenger RNA by reading the DNA. You're going to transcribe messenger RNA. So when you are transcribing, if you have an A on the DNA, you're going to add a U in the messenger RNA. Because remember, RNA doesn't have T's. Where you have a T on the DNA, you're going to add an A, because A's and T's always hang out. If you have a G, you're going to add a C. If you have a C, you're going to add a G. So C's and G's always hang out. G's and C's, C's and G's, T's and A's. But if you're making messenger RNA, you're going to use a U anytime you find an A, because there is no T. In messenger RNA. So it's A C G U. This is kind of cool because one of the chemotherapies that they have makes a form of uracil that messes up the messenger RNA. So the body tries to put that the U that you got through the chemotherapy in to make messenger RNA and it messes that messenger RNA up. So you don't have your cancer cells dividing. They can't make proteins. They can't do the things that they want to do. So hopefully the cancer cells will die. So knowing that messenger RNA has uracil, you can flood the body with, with uh, an alternate form of uracil that doesn't work to make messenger RNA to, to stop cancers. So the messenger RNA that you transcribe using the gene is larger than what you're actually going to use and send out to the, to the ribosome. So what you're going to have to do first is there are certain segments of the messenger RNA that you're going to cut out. You're literally just going to have an enzyme that cuts a piece out. And in a lot of the textbooks, earlier textbooks, it said that it was just thrown away. And they call them introns. And they stayed in the nucleus. Introns stayed in the nucleus because you didn't need them. But now they're saying, no, no, no. There's the, they're not useless. They're used to control the gene expression. So there is a function for the introns. They're not just thrown away. But the pieces that are going to exit the nucleus, the exons will exit the nucleus, they're spliced together. So you started out with a big long piece of messenger RNA, you cut out pieces which are going to stay in the nucleus, the introns stay in the nucleus, and the exons are uh, put back together into a much shorter messenger RNA, and it's that shorter version of messenger RNA that goes out through the nuclear pore and finds a ribosome. About 40 years ago, I worked with one of the guys who discovered the structure of transfer RNA. He, he was at Miami of Ohio, and we spent about two years working together. He was a really nice guy. But this this cracks me up when I see this. If you've never heard the song YMCA, you need to just stop this video and go listen to 
YMCA by the village people. So this is the transfer RNA singing, it's fun to be tRNA, it's fun to be tRNA. And here are the ribosomes reading the messenger RNA. And one strand of messenger RNA can be read simultaneously by a number of ribosomes. So this one's busy translating the messenger RNA into protein. And this one is also, and this one is also. So this is kind of nice because it puts together a lot of things. There's different uh, transfer RNAs. Remember, you have A's and C's and T's and U's. No T's. A's and C's and G's and U's. So we were talking about cutting the messenger RNA and splicing the exons that are going to exit the nucleus and leave the introns behind. But now we know that you can put the exons together in different forms. So you can make different messenger RNAs from the original longer version, which is why you don't need as many genes. So if we've only got 20,000 to 100,000 genes, depending on which slide you're looking at, which textbook you're looking at, which research paper you're looking at, how in the world could we have all the genes that make all the things we are, how we're tall, skinny, fat, how old we'll be when we die, whether we're going to get Alzheimer's, whether we're going to get that kind of cancer that causes either breast cancer, colon cancer, or prostate cancer. So how, with all those genes, then all of a sudden, you know that we get vaccinations so that we can make antibodies, which are proteins, against new things. You didn't know when you were born that COVID was going to appear and that you were going to have to learn how to make antibodies against COVID. So this alternative splicing is one of the ways that they think that we make different antibodies. So I'm old enough that I've had the flu almost every year for many, 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 many decades. So I may have anywhere from 50 to 100 different flu antibodies in my body. And then the colds that I've had. And then I'm old enough that I actually had measles and mumps and chicken pox. But now we have vaccinations so kids don't have to go through uh, suffering with measles, mumps, and chicken pox, and the side effects. Um, I know one of my uh, girlfriends is blind because she had measles. Another kid had meningitis, and he's deaf. So there are a lot of side effects to some of the illnesses, so it's much better to have the vaccination than it is to get the illness, if you can help it. So here's just a cartoon picture showing if you take this DNA and you transcribe it into messenger RNA, and you cut out these introns, you can take these exons and you can put A and C and D together, or B and D and E together, A and E and F. So you can have all different ways of putting these pieces together, and then once you go out and read it at the ribosome, once you translate it at the ribosome, you can have a different protein, a different order of amino acids. This slide is kind of a summary of translation. So here's the ribosome, and it comes in two parts. Remember I talked about like the Mexican sombrero looking thing. So you have the dome, this is the hat's upside down here, and there's the brim. The messenger RNA will slide through the groove, which would be like the, the headband of the sombrero. And for every three bases, there'll be a complementary transfer RNA. So this is a codon, and this is an anticodon, and they come together, A's match with U's, and since this says AAA, 
then you're going to have a transfer RNA that's going to carry a lysine. And then here you have a GUG, so you have a CAC on the end of the transfer RNA, the anticodon, and it's going to drop off a valine. So as these go through, as the messenger RNA slides through the ribosome, transfer RNA is going to come and dock, drop off an amino acid, and then leave. And here comes another one, and it's going to drop off an amino acid, and it's going to leave. And inside the ribosome, it's going to cause the lysine and the valine to bond. You're going to make a peptide bond, a dehydration synthesis bond. And so this protein is being formed. Already the glycine, the serine, the glutamic acid have already been bonded together. So here's your beginning protein. And this one has already dropped this off. This is dropping this one off. This is dropping this one off. This one's about to come in. And you can see it's got the A for the U, the C for the G, and the, excuse me, and the G for the C. So it's the next one that's going to be added to this chain is cysteine right there. So it's going to come in here and be uh, covalently bonded, forced to share electrons. And here comes the next one. So you can see them lining up to drop off their amino acids. So it is translated from messenger RNA to a protein with amino acids being put together. All proteins start with methionine as the first amino acid, and then it goes on until it hits one of those stop codons, and then it stops. To put an amino acid onto a transfer RNA, it costs one ATP. So you have to use the phosphate energy of tearing the phosphate off in order to put the amino acid onto the transfer RNA. And then once it's dropped off its amino acid, then you got to use another ATP to load another amino acid. So you can keep reusing the transfer RNAs over and over again. So like I said, it was kind of neat working with the guy who figured out how the RNA folded back on itself to make the transfer RNA. So only these three bases right here, the anticodon, is accessible to the... Um, ribosome right there so the it, this will go into the ribosome find the messenger RNA and this is UUA so I know that the messenger RNA is going to be AAU and the amino acid is up here Just for fun, you should stop the video at this point, and you know that the codon is AAU. So you could go and look it up in that table, and you would know which amino acid was going to be right here. They don't tell you in this particular slide. Here is an electron micrograph picture actually showing a piece of messenger RNA. So they've made the messenger RNA red. And each of these little things is a ribosome with its two pieces. And this is sliding through. And as it slides through, it's making a protein. So these little green things coming off are the proteins that are being made. So it's kind of cool that the ribosomes can all read the same strand of messenger RNA and make protein from it. So you can really make it quickly. This picture is kind of interesting because it shows you the messenger RNA coming out through the nuclear pores and going out and looking for a ribosome. This picture is neat because here is the messenger RNA being read out in the ribosomes. 
excuse me, out and the ribosomes being read out in the cytoplasm. And this is where the ribosome is actually attached in the plasma reticulum. So as the protein is made, it is made directly into the endoplasmic reticulum. So you can do translation of the messenger RNA out in the cytoplasm with free ribosomes, or you can do it over here so you directly drop off the protein inside the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. And remember, the Golgi apparatus uh, can make vesicles, so you can pinch off, and the protein is transported where you need it to go. Here's a summary of all the stuff that we've been talking about. So let's see if you can follow along and all of this makes sense to you. So here's my double helix of DNA, and I'm going to pull it open with RNA polymerase, and I'm going to expose a, a strand of DNA. I'm not going to use both strands. I'm only going to use one strand. And it has a TAC, a CGC. So these are the, the DNA um, nucleotides that the messenger RNA is going to transcribe. So for every A, there's a T. For Excuse me. For every T, there's an A. For every A, there's a U. There is no T. For the C, there's a G. C, G, G, C. You should be able, given a, a strand of DNA, and tell me what messenger RNA would be made from it. So you just have to remember, C's and G's always go together, so that's easy. And you just have to think, now, am I making DNA or am I making RNA? If I'm making RNA, I can't have any T's. I can only have U's. So wherever I would want to say A com uh, will match up with a T, I'm going to say A will match up with a U. And for every T, it will still, because that's on the DNA, it'll match up with the A of RNA. And this particular very, very short gene segment stops with UGA. So there's your stop. And this is your methionine, which is your start. So you're going to have a start and a stop, and then a bunch of triplets in between. Then you're going to translate it using a ribosome. And where the messenger RNA has an AUG, you're going to have a UAC, which is the methionine. It's going to start your protein off. And then your GCG will pair up with a CGC on the transfer RNA. So you're going to drop off an alanine. So this is showing the transcription of making the messenger RNA and the translation where the messenger RNA combines with the transfer RNA just long enough to drop off an amino acid and then it goes floating off. So we'll stop here and we'll start back up talking about what do we do with the protein once we've made it. That'll be what we'll start with part two of chapter four.